Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 250, recorded on July 20th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. There was quite an upset in the past couple of weeks after Microsoft announced a policy update that would prevent open source software from being sold in the Microsoft Store. They announced the change that would essentially lead to this back in June, with it due to come into effect on July 16th. We opted to wait and cover this, as our contacts suggested Microsoft would be working on a better solution. And now we might have that, I guess? <laughs> it seems this whole mess started with possibly good intentions. Microsoft says they, they wanted to stop unscrupulous developers from making copycat versions of open source apps, which is an issue I have personally noticed in the Windows App Store the few times I've looked around in there. I've seen copies of popular text editors, document editors, web browsers, image editors, etc., etc. Um, just basically quick clones to make a buck. Well, Microsoft's solution? A heavy-handed policy that essentially blanket banned anyone selling software built on open source code. Which, as it turns out, inadvertently perhaps, and also perhaps somewhat obviously, stopped the legitimate owners of open source code from making money on it as well. Now, the response from the open source community was clear and loud. Many took issue with this new wording in the store user policy. So Microsoft, for their credit, they noticed this feedback and they responded fairly quickly, saying they would delay enforcement for now. Since then, they've actually removed the reference to the policy about open source altogether and have added a link to report intellectual property infringement and then clarified the entire situation on Twitter. Probably for the best, but it does leave the question, what is Microsoft going to do about those copycat apps? I mean, they aren't all just scams, but who knows what code could be added to them or the reputation damage that might be caused to the upstream project. Now, they do have a means to report copyright infringement, but that clearly wasn't solving the problem before. So I don't think we can say the problem has been fully resolved just yet. A serious fix is coming soon to Ubuntu 22.04 systems. Currently, if you install an application that pulls in libudev1 as a dependency, you could end up with a very broken system. The bug report on Canonical side states, quote, Installing the package libudev1 results in a large number of critical packages being removed and rendering the system essentially unusable. The fundamental problem here is that app tries to fulfill the request to install that new libudev1 package without upgrading other packages. Unfortunately, this runs into some conflicts, and some of the conflicting packages that end up getting removed to satisfy those conflicts, well, those include things like Ubuntu-Desktop and some other packages that users kind of rely on. Yikes. Double yikes, actually. And... Uh, well, there's not a fix yet. A patch is being worked on as we record this upstream, and then that will be backported to Ubuntu 22.04 when it's ready. So in the meantime, well, watch your auto-installed dependencies close and avoid libudev1 for now. Are you sick and tired of formal prearranged video calls? Well, now you can jump into a Matrix video room and hop into a group video chat low-key style. That's right, the Element team announced their Video Rooms Beta this week. You can create one the same way you would create a regular room and name it, and looks all regular, until you jump into that room. On Element Web and Desktop, once you join a video room, it provides a full-screen video experience with a chat timeline on the side. You can stick it to the top of your room list, you can use picture-in-picture -picture mode to go about your business on your desktop. The UI looks really slick. And you know, Besides these updates, 2022 overall has been a really good year for Matrix. The, quote, open network for decentralized communication has announced record growth of 79% in just the past 12 months. That means it's now counting more than 60 million users. Now, some of that growth is attributed to the growing popularity of the Element app itself. But additionally, 
Germany's entire healthcare system decided to adopt Matrix last summer, which will see over 150,000 organizations in the country gradually migrating to the standard. That's really great to hear. I think the next major milestone the Matrix team has in their sights is to reach 100 million users. The project believes they could actually achieve that by making the protocol even more technically alluring by investing in the Matrix platform to just make it better at all kinds of decentralized things, including end-to-end encrypted video conferencing and more. A quick reminder that Scale 19X is coming up soon, July 28th through the 31st at the LAX Hilton. If you're not familiar, Scale is the largest community-run, open-source, and free software conference in North America. It's held annually in the greater Los Angeles area. Listeners can use the promo code LAS50 to get 50% off already very reasonably priced tickets. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support the show. Linode is really the Linux geeks cloud. With 11 data centers worldwide, they've been hard at work for nearly 19 years creating the best experience to run applications on Linux. Full stop. And if you'd like to build it yourself from the ground up, or if you'd prefer just to click and deploy one of their ready-to-go stacks, Linode has excellent options for you. And the performance is incredible. I, I just wouldn't be hosting my stuff there and all the stuff that the audience has to interact with if performance wasn't anything but the best. Just a few short months ago, Linode began rolling out screaming fast NVMe-based block storage. They have super flexible S3-compatible object storage, an easy-to-use dashboard that lets you bring it all together, and tons of other options for deploying your system to build it just the way you want it. And they've got just about every distribution you could ever possibly want to run on a server. After you've been using Linode for a minute, I think if you're like me, you're going to start appreciating the small things, like their super clean, well-documented API, their command line tool, there are tons of documentation and eBooks that are just fantastic resources that are available for free. And I know I have heard from so many listeners, they're blown away by how great Linode support is whenever they get in a bit of a jam. Linode helps them out. So for the best customer support, super fast rigs and networking, and a Linux culture that runs deep, well, there's a lot of reasons to choose Linode. So let's put it over the top. Go get $100 in credit and support the show. Linode.com slash LAN. And a really big thank you to Collide. Collide.com slash LAN. Collide is an endpoint security solution that uses the most powerful untapped resource in IT, end users. When you're trying to achieve security goals, whether for a third-party audit or your own compliance standards, the conventional wisdom has been to treat every single device like Fort Knox, Old-school device manager tools like MDMs force disruptive agents onto employees' devices and slow performance. I hated that, and you know it's true. It turns IT admins and users against each other. Collide does things differently. Instead of forcing changes on users, Collide sends them security recommendations via Slack. Collide will automatically notify your team when the device is insecure and give them step-by-step instructions on how to solve the problem. By reaching out to employees via a friendly Slack DM and educating them about company policies, Collide can help build a culture in which everyone contributes to security because everyone understands it and why to do it. For IT admins, well, Collide provides a single dashboard that lets you monitor the security of your entire fleet, whether they're running on Mac, Windows, or absolutely Linux. You can see at a glance which employees have their disencrypted, OS up to date, password managers installed, Or really, just make sure it's easy for your auditors, customers, and leadership to get reports on where things are at. So that's Collide. User-centered, cross-platform endpoint security for teams that Slack. You can meet your compliance goals by putting users first. Visit collide.com slash LAN to find out how. If you follow that link, they'll hook you up with a goodie bag, including a free t-shirt, just for activating a free trial. Support the show and get a free shirt at collide.com slash LAN. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash LAN. The Asahi Linux project continues to work diligently to get Linux fully working on the new Apple SoCs. But they've been getting their fair share of curveballs lately. 
When Apple introduced the Mac Studio, for instance, it came with the M1 Ultra chip, which required some work, but on the whole, wasn't a significant change in the platform. Then came the M2, which, as we covered, Hector got Linux up and going on in a 12-hour stream bring-up marathon. That was quite the event. The M2, in my opinion, was really the first test of a core theory that the project had. When I interviewed Hector at the start of the Asahi Linux project, I asked him how the project would handle future Apple M chip updates. At the time, he told me he expected future versions of the chips would mostly be iterative, and that most of the drivers would likely work unmodified. So, now we get a chance to see just how well that theory held up. Pretty well, it seems. The project has not been tested on the MacBook Air yet, only the M2 MacBook Pro 13, so support is very experimental, especially considering that the M1 support is, well, also still experimental. But for most cases, much of the drivers and other code created does indeed just work on the M2. Now, there's no doubt a whole bunch more work to be done, but overall... I think they're pleased, and probably right to be pleased, with the results so far. And we can probably all imagine, Apple does things a little bit differently with their hardware builds. For example, in a recent project status update, the team wrote that the way Apple connects the keyboard and the trackpad together and then to the motherboard is unlike any other manufacturer ever. And of course, there's lots of little details like that across the system, which make a difference when you're writing drivers. The project also found that the beta of the next release of macOS Ventura, well, it broke a, quote, clever shortcut that the Asahi boot process was using, which has been fixed. But I know what you're really wondering about. How's that old GPU support coming along? Well, there's some good news there, too. A couple of months ago, Asahi Lena joined the team and took on the challenge of reverse engineering the M1 GPU hardware interface and writing a driver for it. In this short time, she's already built a prototype driver good enough to run real graphics applications and benchmarks, building on top of the existing Mesa work. The proof of concept uses the mini bootloader via a USB connection and runs the driver remotely, so it is bottlenecked by USB bandwidth. But... She's also demonstrated that the GPU proper renders the GL Mark II fong-shaded bunny scene at over 1,000 FPS, at 1080p resolution, no less. This fully open-source stack also passes 94% of the Draw Elements GLES2 test suite. That is some major progress. That's huge. And... I suspect something we're going to be hearing a lot more when the project has time to do a full write-up on it. I think they're going to do a dedicated post, so we'll keep our eye out for that. Also noteworthy, thanks to the use of the Asahi installer and the mini bootloader with U-Boot, OpenBSD 7.1 achieved M1 support back in April. No M2 support yet, but that is on the radar, and it's scheduled for OpenBSD 7.2 in November. There's just a lot going on. We'll keep an eye on all of this and everything else happening in the world of Linux and open source news. So be sure you go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe. That way you get every new episode. And head over to linuxactionnews.com slash contact if you'd like to get in touch. If you'd like to support this show, you can send us a boost with a new podcast app or become a member at jupiter.party and get an ad-free version of this year's show. If you're not, we'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week.